I get that in ministry world, we aren't really fond of words like branding and marketing. They are commerce related words, right? Mike Kim has an important way of refocusing the definition of those words, making them a lot more palatable for those of us who are weary of uh, businessifying faith. Mike says that marketing isn't about a sale, it's about beginning a relationship. We can get behind that, can't we? After all, isn't that what we're called to do to foster relationship? In order to meet people in the digital space and begin our relationships, we need to engage in a bit of branding and marketing. And the fact is, you have a brand. You may not be cultivating it, but you do have one. The goal of what we're trying to do in this session is to make it as easy as possible for people to learn about you, your ministry, and how you build a relationship. That is the goal of cultivating some branding. There's a ton of great stuff to be learned here, so let's get to it. Pastoring in the Digital Parish with Mike Kim. Mike Kim is a business coach and marketing strategist who specializes in personal branding, product launch strategies, and copywriting. He's the author of You Are the Brand, which is a book that I have found super relevant to what I believe is the future of the pastorate, especially as it relates to digital ministry. And Mike has kind of a cool core belief or philosophy about marketing, and that's that marketing isn't about closing a sale. It's about opening a relationship. We're going to get to that towards the end of our conversation. But first, Mike, I think it's important to note for our audience that you have a background in ministry. So let's start there. You're in a unique position right now where you've worked in both ministry and now are working in coaching and consulting. So how is ministry work similar to the work that you're doing now as a coaching consultant? Well, first, Ryan, it's an honor to be here. And uh, I, I don't get to talk a lot about this topic. Uh, so I'm really grateful for this Good. opportunity. Um, you know, it's it's incredible because I do coach a lot. M many of my clients are Christians. Mm -hmm. um, they are making a transition in life. You know, some are coming out of the pastorate. Some are coming out of vocational ministry. Some are missionaries who are coming off the field. And then there's another side to what I do where I help missionaries and ministry leaders raise money. And so I kind of, I'm working with people who are on both ends of the spectrum, yeah. right? And I always tell folks that I cannot think of a profession that better prepares you to create impact with your ideas, to get a message heard in, the, in our case, the gospel, um, than the ministry itself. Mm -hmm. There are so many soft skills that I carry from my experience in ministry that I've brought over into coaching. If you really think about it, folks who are in corporate America, middle management, you name it, retail, well, they're not used to speaking in front of people. <laughs> they're not used to mentoring groups of people or having one-on-one -on -one counseling calls or meetings or coffee. You know, they're not used to planning events. They're not used to being on stage. They're not used to journaling and study, mm. you know, for, a, for to get a message out there. So all of these soft skills and, and the people skills and the discernment and that that's not even scratching on the spiritual gifts, right? The discernment, mm. that, that, that openness to, okay, what is God saying here? What is happening here? What's going on with this person? Hundreds of hours we've had experience, you and I and others listening. And now you're telling me all I have to do is sit here and jump on a, <laughs> a microphone and record a podcast and create some content on social media. Man, I was doing that every Sunday. Right. Yeah. So uh, we are we are totally prepared for this line of work. Well, you mentioned some of the soft skills that you're using now as a as a consultant and coach. What are some of those soft skills? Well, it's a lot of that. It's it's the discernment. Yeah, okay. It's, it's trying. Yeah. It's funny because I uh, when I when I work with a client or I run a coaching group. Uh, I meet with everybody one on one just for a few minutes before we really get started with the program, 15 minutes or so. And that's almost all I need. They fill out a little intake form. I find out a little bit about them. And um, like, I'm just like able to get to the heart of what's really going on. And that just comes from hundreds and hundreds of hours of counseling people, of coaching people in within the context of ministry, of course. Now I'm like, okay, this person says this, but what's really going on underneath there, you know, deeper in their heart is mm -hmm. this. 
and then you kind of read their mail and they're like, well, I just, I just don't understand how you can see all this in me. And I'm like, mm. Oh, well, yeah, this is, this is from years and years of, of, of ministry. Um, and I think an, another thing I'd add to that, you know, there are a lot of coaches in the business space, in the professional space, all they really want to do, to be honest, is make a dollar, mm -hmm. you know, and we need more people in that space who want to empower others, who want to make their ceiling someone else's floor. Uh, I find that I take a lot of these kingdom principles into my work and people, whether they're believers or not, it, it's incomprehensible to them. They're like, you want to give me a shot? You want to platform mm -hmm. me? You want to talk about me? You want to promote me? You, you're being generous with opportunities towards me. I'm like, yeah. And I've just always felt like that's what we're supposed to do as believers and as leaders within that context. And I just carry that over into my business. Yeah. Okay. I, I love that relationship of, um, well, empowering others. Like that speaks to a lot of us as ministry in ministry. And because of that, like sometimes we are pretty shy, even reluctant to kind of empower ourselves and branding speaks into that. Like branding is a way of, well, enabling some self empowerment. So you're able to take this aspect of this kind of dual view from the ministry and from the, the coaching side about branding uh, and how necessary it is. So for you, like what kind of branding are you doing now or how, how valuable is branding for you as a coach and creator? Well, it's branding has always just been about identity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I get it, Ryan. When I was in, in vocational ministry, um, I was a youth pastor. I was a worship pastor. You know, that was a full-time position for a number mm -hmm. of years. Uh, we did all the things, you know, the music, the conferences. We created albums. We wrote songs. Uh, we had all the big, you know, worship bands come to our church and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then for a while, I served as an associate pastor. And all those years when I was in those roles, I thought marketing and branding were bad yeah. words. <laughs> it, I was like, that's Mike, evil, a lot right? of people are like still ministry. there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Ministry and marketing, like mixing these two is like, is like oil and water, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, when, when I was, you know, headlong in, in that role, uh, I got to admit, I desperately wanted people to know um, about what God was doing in our ministry. I, I, I thought it was really good. You know, my heart was genuine. And it honestly wasn't about money. It wasn't about fame. I'm not really a, a limelight type of guy, much like many of us who are listening right now. For me, it was about impact. And I knew that what we were doing and building were those things were truly helping people and truly helping churches. So this catch, you know, that this catch 22 I was in, I, I didn't want to be pushy. I didn't want to pester people. And uh, here's the worst thing that someone could call me if when I was or when I was in ministry. Right. It wasn't sinful because we all know we're mm -hmm. all sinners. Right. The worst thing was, dude, if somebody called me prideful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that cut to the core, like you are self promotional. And so to be labeled like this egocentric guy or arrogant or self-promoting was like the one thing I tried to avoid at all costs. And so I didn't want to market. I shut everything down. I just felt like God would promote us in his timing, yeah. right? It, but I do see things differently, right? Because I, I think I've become more healthy in the outlook. So I'm, I'm happy to kind of unpack that a little bit because there is, there does feel like what's the balance, what's right. But I learned some things in that journey, especially towards the tail end of my years in ministry and now being in business and seeing the other side of things. But I get what you're saying, and I, I've been yeah. there. Yeah. The jump that I'm hoping that some of our listeners will make here is the relationship between being a minister and being a coach. And, and in order to kind of successfully mm -hmm. be a coach in today's marketplace, sorry to use that word again, but um, in in the digital realm, we'll call it that instead of the marketplace, like you need to be able to kind of put yourself out there and represent yourself in a certain way. And that's what branding is. So, uh, with that in mind, like what are some of the ways that you, Mike, are kind of putting yourself out there in a healthy and, um, relevant way for, uh, people to see who you are to begin to form a relationship? Yeah. You know, when we talk about brand, Ryan, 
brand is all just about identity. It's always been about identity. You know, all the way back to when farmers used to brand their livestock mm -hmm. with a, an identifying mark, right? They burn it into the hide and say, that's my cow. Uh, all the way till today where everyone's on Instagram and YouTube. All of this stuff about branding has always been about identity, having a clear identity. Now, I talk a lot in my coaching business and even with organizations about a personal brand, the power of a personal brand. And what I mean by a personal brand is the identity that each of us carry as individuals, as leaders, in many cases as ministry leaders, um, and in my case as a coach and a consultant, um, that's based off the combination of four things, right? I'm not just a cow. I'm not just a Nike shoe, <laughs> right? I'm a person. Mm -hmm. And so these four things are what make up our personal brand, our ideas, our expertise, our reputation, and our personality. I'll say that again. Our ideas, our expertise, our reputation, and our personality. And if you really think about any coach, motivational speaker, author, celebrity, athlete, and yes, even a minister, you can see that these four things are what make up who we view them as, mm -hmm. right? There's some preachers and pastors who are better preachers and pastors than they are mm -hmm. authors. There are some whose ideas we like and others we don't like, right? We'll argue about the, in, in the ministry space, we'll argue about it theologically, mm -hmm. right? And then there's some guys, we just, some guys and girls, we just don't like their personality. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not here to throw any, <laughs> anybody under the bus, but we're like, oh, look at them in their, you know, $3,000 Air Jordan sneakers <laughs> walking out on stage and being all hip. And some people like that personality and other people do not. Uh -huh. You know, I have my personal preferences, right? But it has nothing to do really with their message. If we f feel like their theology is right, we just don't like the fact that he's wearing $3,000 uh -huh. sneakers, right? Like, what is that? So... When I talk about a personal brand and how we can carry this into, you know, the ministry space, um, I see people building this identity, this personal brand in one of two ways, you know, in the market and neither of them are working. So I'll talk about what I think we should cool. all do. But on one hand, you see people who are presenting a false version of themselves. Like, to be honest, they mm -hmm. really are. Right. Um, in business, I see some folks do this. Right? It's so ridiculous, but they'll rent a mansion on Airbnb. They'll stage a photo shoot and they'll like sort of imply that it's their yeah. house. Mm -hmm. Right. And these people do not realize that the attention they seek is not owed to them. It's earned. It's not about image. It's about character. And dude, you and I do not need to go down the rabbit trail of how many high profile, prominent ministers we've seen, you know, fall, if you will, quote unquote, yeah. right? Um, because they're so caught up in all this other stuff, you know, rubbing elbows with celebrities, wearing the same kind of clothes, hanging out, going to the Oscars and bloom, and it just blows up, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I, was, I, I live just outside New York City and the, you know, big thing happened here a year right. ago, right? Um, and then you have this other side where what's happening in the blogosphere, okay? These people are not maybe ministers from a pulpit, but they have become leaders, tribal leaders, quote unquote, tribal leaders in their own right on social media. And they have built like a, a following based on what they hate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, I follow these, some of these accounts cause I'm just fascinated by how they're communicating the phenomenon of what's, what's mm -hmm. going on. So I see, uh, right now, you know, the deconstruction mm -hmm. movement is huge. Yeah. These are all these people, you and I are probably about the same age. I'm in my early forties. And you know, these, these are folks who grew up in that mega church culture, right? Hip church had their talents and had, 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 you know, uh, all this leadership and they were involved intimately in leadership. And they were saying, this was jacked up. This was screwed up. This is, this is wrong. I don't believe in this anymore. And they, they found a huge community, mm -hmm. right? And here's what I, I see it as I'm like, well, they're kind of oversharing things in the name of authenticity mm. and they're not really solving a problem. They're selling their struggles instead of a solution. Okay. Yeah. And they're trying to build a community around a car mm. wreck. 
I mean, I don't know about you, God forbid, car wrecks, right? But you drive down a highway and everyone's rubbernecking and delays traffic for an hour. I mean, this happens all the time where I live in New York. And I'm like, okay, we got a lot of eyeballs, but no one stays. Mm -hmm. You can't build a community mm -hmm. around it, right? You can't base it on what your pain is and what hurt you've experienced. You have to help people and add value at some point. So what I see working now, is and and i think it'll be forever um simply to ask yourself this as a litmus test can i build a campfire around what i'm sharing okay yeah by that i mean is is what you're sharing warm is it inviting is it inclusive is it uh, a place where people can share their stories i mean this is stuff we all do at a campfire is it a place where you can build a community around are you someone that people want to spend time with around a campfire do they want to come to your campfire because it's a light in a dark place. And I can't help but get this image in my mind of, you know, Jesus out in the countryside at night, hanging out with the disciples and some other people and they start up a fire. I mean, it's 2021, 2022. And you and I dude could go to a restaurant and we will pay extra for the seat that has the <laughs> fake campfire outside. You know, the, there's just True. something warm and communal. About <laughs> yeah. it, right. And so that's kind of what I'm referring to when you're putting yourself out there in, as a brand in this space, um, share stuff, be authentic, share, share family, share beliefs, share the struggles, share the solutions. But all of it is an extension of your ideas, your expertise, your reputation, and your personality. Mm. Yeah. Well, and that brings up the, the point that everybody really has a brand, whether we choose to cultivate it or not. Right. So I think right. the awareness that you're calling us towards is just to cultivate that brand, to be authentic about what we're putting out there. Um, very good. Yeah. Well, for someone to be successful in the, in the coaching business and to communicate who they are, um, you've pointed out that they really need to be addressing a problem. Uh, and sometimes we're not really good at that uh, within like the ministry world, at least naming that there is a problem that we're trying to to address. So based on your own ministerial ministerial experience, like what problems might we be throwing out there that we can invest in addressing? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's funny because I was just talking to a client named Kent and uh, he's a pastor and he started kind of coaching people on the okay. side uh, and he's doing really well um, doing it. So he's, he's not super, like he's not exactly bivocational. He's earned mm -hmm. income from his coaching. And, um, this is this has been a struggle for him because I'm like, well, and, and I've known him for a long time. And I said, Kent, as a pastor, um, you have to solve or you have to be able to speak to everyone's yeah. problems, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you, you got to he's preaching on Sunday morning. The people in his church run the yeah. gamut, right? I mean, they're from all walks of life, all socioeconomic levels, education levels, everything, right? And yet when you go into coaching, you have to narrow that down because you can't coach everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's a struggle oftentimes for ministry leaders to kind of niche that. Yeah. Down. We feel like we're being however, exclusive. Would, if, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So however, though, I would say this, there are all, there are always things that each and every one of us as individuals feel like we are better at than other things. Um, some people, some ministry leaders are like, I love counseling way more than preaching. Yeah. I love teaching way more than evangelism. I just, it just feels right. I like leading worship way more than, you know, uh, leading a Bible study. And yet we're willing to do all these things, but we're also trying to find like where our giftings are. Right. So for me, what I realized early on, you know, was that when I looked at what I loved to do in ministry, I, I did everything that I was you know, required to do. I would do funerals. I would preach. I would all those things. But I really loved going deep with a few people. Mm -hmm. I love leadership mm -hmm. development. I love recruiting people onto our worship team. I loved raising up young worship leaders. I loved hosting conferences and rallying people in our region together. I was working in New England at the time. And I've, I've kind of oriented my business and my coaching practice towards those things. And by nature, it's sort of narrowed down who I reach. Mm -hmm. So I find that coaching is actually an opportunity for you to double down on the things that you're, you're naturally good at, right? Um, it's just, it's, 
it's been fun and it's been liberating in that sense because then I can really, really feel like I'm in the flow of, of what I do. Right. Like it, I say it like this, you know, talent doesn't re, like talent doesn't replace the need for hard work. It clarifies mm. it. So when I'm coaching and I find that I'm talented or gifted in, in certain things, you know, um, mentoring people, going deep with a small group of people, and um, doing really intense work in a short amount of time. That doesn't mean I just like, okay, well, I'll let that coast and I'll build my skills elsewhere. No, I want to get really good at those three things. And that's what coaching affords the opportunity for us to do. Okay. Well, let's talk about your, your PB3, your personal branding three. Yeah. Uh, this addresses a big hole for a lot of ministries because in as you touched on in our well-meaning efforts to – offer something for everybody. Um, in the end, sometimes we can miss just about everyone in the same way. Would you describe for us briefly what the PB3 is? Yeah. So um, I'm glad you asked this because it, I'm not going to use any language. Here, <laughs> it's I'm okay. Jersey, we're, so we're, we're a little bit saltier. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of folks, when I start to work with them and, and um, especially as they're, as they're trying to coach, you know, I, I say, well, what's your point of view? And like, what, what is, what do you mean? What's my point of view? I'm like, you got to have a point of view. Otherwise you're not going to stand out. You need contrast. You know, those of you watching us on video, I'm wearing a black shirt with a white background. You can see me, you know, there's contrast. And, um, sometimes, or many times I would say we hide behind scripture. <laughs> we hide behind our, our, our movement or denominations vision statement. Um, when I coach missionaries uh, to raise support, uh, the first session I say, you're not allowed to use any Christianese or use Bible verses in your vision statement. Mm. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> you, would have, you would have thought I asked them to like, you know, sacrifice their child or something. <laughs> I was like, because I want to get to the core of what you see, because God gave you a vision. God gave you a brain. God gave you a desire in your heart. So I ask people, number one, what pisses you off? Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and let me clarify that by that, what I'm really trying to get to is the injustice they see yeah, in the world. Okay. That is a, that is a biblical word, mm -hmm. right? God is a God of injustice, uh, justice, and he hates injustice, right? So what is the injustice you see in the world? What pisses you off? Number two, what breaks your heart? That's the compassion you have for people or for a particular cause. And then number three, what is the big problem you're trying to solve? That is the purpose of your ministry, your church, your organization, your nonprofit. And if you can answer those three things very clearly and they stem from your core, you've got a branding message. Mm. You've got something to go to the world with and say, hey, we've staked our flag here. We've raised the flag. This is how we help people. This is the one thing that we do really, really well. And of course, there are other ancillary things that people can do um, as a result of coming in. But you look at these big organizations, you know, whether they're you know faith forward or not. Focus on the family, right? World vision. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, they're all you know um, IJM, you know, uh, which uh, rescues people from the sex trade, right? All over the all over the world. And these organizations have staked their claim. And if you really think about it, churches try to do the same yeah. thing. We're in Atlanta. This is our city, and we're gonna we're gonna multi-site church. And there's a vision there. Dallas is our city. You know, you name it. North Carolina. You know, Charlotte. You know, and there are a lot of churches that we associate with those cities mm -hmm. because they've become so clear in their mission. So, you know, we are we are ticked off that. People are going to hell in Dallas, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, I think at TD Jake's church, whenever I'm in Dallas, I, you know, I try to visit, I like him as a, as a preacher in it. And, um, but it's very clear. He has a burden and he's been given a burden to reach particularly the African American mm -hmm. community in Dallas, you know, and, um, he's, he's, you know, agree with him or not, but he has tried to empower his people and the city of Dallas, um, to, to lift up that community, get a better job, make more money, succeed, you know, be influential in the marketplace. These are his messages, yeah. right? And anyone else can come, but 
that's his vision. That's, that's the purpose of their church. And so you see this at play, Ryan. I mean, you can deconstruct that in any person or organization. It means that they have clarity in their okay. message. Yeah, and that's important because it, I think our fear when setting up those messages is that we are going to exclude some people. Uh, and nothing that you mentioned is exclusive to anybody, right? It, it's just as saying, you know, here is who we are in an authentic way, uh, whether that be like, hey, we are building a community where we hope everybody feels a sense of belonging to like, hey, we are building a community that is going to eradicate homelessness in our in our community. Like all that is is not necessarily exclusive to anybody. But it does give you like a communication of what you're going to find when you engage with this community, right? Uh, And that's incredibly important. And I think it's something that we sometimes miss in churches because uh, we want to speak such a broad message, right? Um, We want to be able to kind of provide like an entry point at all levels uh, for all people. And that just doesn't work, does it? No, it's it's sort of like, you know, we hear these like kind of cool vision statements for churches and organizations, mm-hmm. but they don't really say yeah. anything, right? To know him and make him known. <laughs> okay, yes, I know that. I get that. I signed up for that when I gave my life to Christ. Yeah. You know, I get that. Um, and and what does that mean for us in this particular city or community or region? What does what does that mean for us trying to solve this particular problem? Mm-hmm. Um, what is the problem we're particularly going to solve in order to know him and make him known? Mm. You know, do we help, you know, alleviate homelessness? Do we help alleviate, you know, suffering of kids who have been rescued out of the sex trade? You know, what do we do? Yeah. And that's the clarity that I'm always pushing people to distill, to get to. Mm. Absolutely. Um. Yeah, this is great clarifying work because it it shows it, it we're coming from a marketing standpoint, and yet like this shows the relevance towards ministry. And so, it, your philosophy of marketing is that it's not about a sale; it's about opening a relationship. So, how does branding play into that? How is branding a means for opening a relationship? Yeah, you know, branding is about identity. So like, um, and, and I, I say that because I've, I'm in the business space so much. I meet all these people who just want to, you know, close the sale, yeah, close the okay. sale, close the sale. I'm like, look, marketing is not about closing a sale anymore. It's, it, you can't do it anymore. It's, it's changed. Marketing is all about opening a relationship. So let's just use some common sense here. Um, first, what relationship do you know of that is going to, that, what is there such thing as a thriving relationship when you don't talk to the person mm. and you only call them when you need something? That's not a, that's not a healthy relationship. Yep. Okay. So right there. So we don't want to just bombard people, whether we're a ministry or a business and, you know, missionaries, you know, they, they are guilty of this. I only hear from, you know, Bob when he needs mm. money and then Bob comes into my program. And I'm like, Bob, that's your fault. You got to change. You can, exp- they're not piggy banks. They are people. You know, so you want to build relationship with these folks, not just hit them up when you need, like you need an allow- allowance, right? So when I look at this process, I'm going to share this real quick process here. How do we make these decisions to trust people, to trust brands, to trust organizations, to trust leaders? We all go through this progression. No, like, trust, try, buy, repeat, refer. If you don't know about Apple, you're not going to have a chance to like Apple. Mm. And if you don't like Apple, then you're definitely not going to trust Apple. But if you like them, you might trust them. And if you trust them, you might try out an iPhone or an iPad. You might go to the store and say, okay, these guys kind of have their thing together. It feels nice in the store. It's very clear what they do. I'm going to try it out. And if you like what you try, you buy. And after you buy, you repeat buy. You buy the iPhone every year or two years. (laughs) And then you tell everybody about it. You refer people. This is what we do, not just with consumer products, not with just with other things that we buy, but with people. Um, I think about this in in terms of relationships. You know, my friends are always trying to set me up, Ryan. (laughs) They're like, oh, this girl, this girl, you you know. Look, I'm not going to walk up to some some girl on the first day and be like, you want to get married? Mm -hmm. 
Yo, she doesn't even know me. She hasn't had a chance to even like me. We've known each other all of the 15 minutes sitting down for coffee. She definitely doesn't trust me yet, right? And she's like, okay, well, some friends told me about you. It's just common sense. So it's our job as leaders, as communicators, as leaders of organizations or as coaches, whatever, to make it easy for people to know, like, and trust us. And you do that by sharing content online, by sharing a little bit of what you know and who you are and your journey. And through that, you're giving people an opportunity to try. Um, not to get super meta, but that's exactly what's happened for the last 20 so minutes on this mm -hmm. podcast. Most of you who are listening right now had never heard of me. You did not know me. And if you're still listening, it might mean that you kind of like, he's not bad. I kind of <laughs> like this guy. And he said a few good things here and there. I kind of trust him. And I'm going to try him out by continuing to listen to the rest of this interview. Well, maybe at some point you're like, well, you know what? I'm really grateful to Ryan for bringing Mike on the show. I'm going to go try him out and I'm going to read a sample of his yeah. book. And, oh, it's only 15 bucks. I'm going to buy the book. You are the brand. And you buy it, and if you like that, you're going to repeat, buy some other things, and you're going to refer the book. And all this happened in just a few minutes. That's what's happening. So it's our responsibility to do that, you know, to fill those gaps, the no like, trust, try, and then let people make the quote-unquote purchase or donate or whatever action it is that you want them yeah. to take. Well, and if we think about that in relation to our churches, uh, it lowers the bar to entry. Like if we already have a sense of comfort with the community that we're considering engaging with, then, you know, the transition into actual presence becomes so much easier. Um, and so us being able to portray a brand just helps people feel that sense of comfort. And uh, what I've appreciated about, um, well, the way that you express yourself, Mike, in what I've appreciated about your book is that you, you give some great ideas that's totally relevant, but also like you and yourself are a good case study, <laughs> like even going through that because <laughs> like we haven't been corresponding for very long. Um, and, and yet when we sat down for this interview, like I felt like I knew you pretty well. It's just one of those weird things. And I think that if we can provide that experience for the people who might be engaging in our ministries, like when they come to us, they know us pretty well already. Um, well, we're just going to find more and more people responding to that. Um, so. Absolutely. And I, and I feel honestly, Ryan, like, you know, where, where I see this going in this digital mm -hmm. age, um, you know, if you're a pastor or you're a ministry leader listening in right now, I'm, I'm telling you right now, just from what I see in marketing, the way human beings, this is not a spiritual concept. It's just the way human beings are behaving with technology and social media and all these things everything's getting decentralized. Mm -hmm. Everything is decentralized. People, my, my friends will say, yeah, I, I still go to church. When's the last time you went? Two years ago, but I watch online every Sunday. We have three kids under five years old. There's no way I'm bringing them to, to church. Everything's getting decentralized. No one's going to movie theaters, right? <laughs> Baseball stadiums, athletic events. It's been a struggle to get people back in. Society itself is decentralizing so we cannot expect them just to come to a building. And if that's the case, where are we going to meet them? We're going to meet them on the thing that they are um, basically attached at the hip to, their phone. Mm -hmm. That device is a portal to a person. And we need to learn as communicators how to speak to one person on their device at their own pace and in their own space. Mm. When I binge, Bill, I was binging Billy Graham sermons the other day. He's, yeah. he's <laughs> dead and he's still ministering to me, mm. but it's like I'm watching it on my phone. And I'm just like, this is speaking to me, you know, and it's, we have to be able to, uh, and I'm going to lay a challenge out here. I think that I've met so many ministry leaders who cannot get vulnerable and cannot get like authentic about who they are, what they struggle with, what their story has been. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to reach people. 
in the next couple of years and forever because of the technology. Um, there is no trust. People do not trust. They are intrinsically distrustful of authority figures. And um, what I've seen in a lot of a lot of ministry leaders is, um, and, and I can say this coming from that space, like they're some of the most insecure people I've met. Mm. And so they will hide and shield behind a position or behind scripture. And what people are dying for, their congregation, people who are, you know, kind of on the fringes of the congregation or just out there on the internet, what they're dying for is just a drop of vulnerability, mm. you know, and um, we've just got to learn how to get real with people, like really, really, and still lead because the nature of leadership is changing. The nature of it, all this is changing because it's changed because of technology. You're seeing the bar lower, you know, and I, I hope that I'm explaining this well, but the fact that I can tweet LeBron James and he might respond to mm, me, yeah, that level of access that the general public now has, you know, I can tweet the rock. I can, you know, you know, I can Instagram him and he might respond and I can email my pastor and he won't get back to mm. me for four weeks. Mm. Dude, there's a disconnect there, man. And that's yeah. not going to, that's not going to, it's not going to float. So we have a responsibility to get healthier become more secure in who we are, do that deep work so that we can share ourselves and our journeys from a place of healing and health and help others along the way and say, you're not alone. I'm very open about the fact that I got divorced. I cannot tell you how many people, Christians or non-Christians have said, thank mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a pastor, yeah. Ryan, to be honest. I really feel like I do, I, I am. And uh, I don't get to see everybody in person all the time, but I guess I have an online church right. and whenever we do events, man, people show up and we're, oh, man, it's, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's relationship. So, mm -hmm. well, yeah. let's, uh, let's close with this, uh, one last question since you issued this challenge to be vulnerable. So speaking from coach to client here, uh, how, what might be a first step for that reluctant minister, uh, um, might need to take towards a, a step towards vulnerability? Yeah. Um, here's, here's what I would do. I would, I would sit down and just jot down maybe one lesson or principle that you've learned that's been really significant for you in the last three years. Mm. You know, what do you, what have you learned in the last three years that you wish you knew 10 years ago? Or what have you learned in the last three months you wish you knew three years ago? Just jot that down. Right. And it's probably going to be a principle of some sort. Right. And then just ask yourself, how did I learn mm. this? And what's going to happen is a story is going to come out. How did I learn this? A story is going to come out. And then you just tell that story. And that, that's, that's it. You know, that's it. And it doesn't need to be some tweetable, epic, viral quote lesson. <laughs> <laughs> it can simply be. God really, really loves me. Mm. He really, really loves me. Well, how'd you learn that, Mike? Because when I went through all this heartache and all this pain, you know, um, our marriage fell apart. You know, we're still friends. We're still friendly, but it was just it was so painful, just everything that happened. I was devastated. And uh, I numbed in un really unhealthy mm. ways. And... Um, I know he loves me because he met me on the side of a sidewalk when I was puking, you know, in the middle of New York mm. city. And see, I can say that. And, and, and like, and you share that, like I've shared that with my audience. I've shared that on my podcast. I've shared that with my Instagram following and people will write me and they will, they will say, I cried when I read mm. that. I just wrote my list earlier this week, my email list about how this girl rejected me because <laughs> I was super interested in her. <laughs> and I wrote down the lessons that I learned and, it's just a story. And they're like, wow, this is super vulnerable. Thanks for sharing this for, with us. And I had a number of people say, we're going to pray for mm. you, you know? And it's just that simple, Ryan. God loves me. How'd you learn that in the last three years? Well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you a story. Share that story. 
and you'll start to make uh, you start to take steps forward and you will start to exercise that muscle of self-expression. That's what's so important. Mm. We know God's in control. We know God has your life in his hands. We know God's story, but we want to hear God's story in your mm. story. Yeah. And that's not wrong. That's actually a very beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. And it's needed. Yeah. Well, Mike, we have our homework. Thank you so much for uh, giving us that on this <laughs> session. And um, is MikeKim.com the best way to reach out to you? That is. And if you guys are on Instagram, that's my favorite social media platform. You can just follow me there, Mike Kim TV. Um, I actually am giving away the audio book of my right book. On. So if you go to Instagram, see that in the link there, you can grab it. Um, and um, yeah, pick up the book follow the podcast, social media will connect. Um, let me know that you were, you heard us, you heard Ryan and I, and, uh, I'll know we can talk about some other things. Cool. Here. So All right. yeah. thanks for Thank having me. Thank you so much. I'm a big fan of Mike Kim's book, so I would definitely recommend checking it out. If you want to check out more sessions of pastoring in the digital parish, I would really appreciate that. Some good related episodes are becoming a micro famous minister with Matt Johnson and a solo episode I did called Your First Steps into Digital Ministry, which is all about cultivating a presence online. United Methodist Communications makes this masterclass in digital ministry possible. Learn more at resourceumc.org. And that's going to be it for this session. My name is Ryan Dunn. It's been a pleasure putting this together. I've learned tons. Hope you have too. Peace.